Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to my home city. I uh, hope the journey wasn't too bad. Um, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I think uh, I'm going to do a couple of disclaimers to start with because I have to appreciate that some of you are going to be on these drugs and we're going to talk about trial data and that's going to involve talking about time to the cancer getting worse, survival data. But I want to stress that these are averages. They do not mean that at this point in time your cancer is going to get worse. So I am mindful of that. The other thing is to talk about this topic, we're going to compare different trials. Um, and one of the biggest things we're taught in the medical world is you do not compare trial against trial because there's so many disparities in terms of how trials are run. But the real world is, especially in things like ALK, where it's a rare mutation, you're not going to get head-to-heads for drugs that are kind of getting traction. Of course, we had head-to-heads in the old days, but for the drugs that we're talking about now, we're not in a world where we're going to see these head-to-heads happen. Uh, it would take too long for these trials to read out. So the reality is we are kind of forced to looking at one trial and comparing that with another trial. The final disclaimer is there are going to be lots of scientific slides, the kind of ones that we put up in Congresses. Some of you may well understand them. Don't worry, I don't understand all of them, but I will talk you through them. So, but it's probably the best way to take you through this journey of, well, I've kind of coined it, what is the optimal first line drug? And the other, actually, is one more disclaimer, I'm kind of disclaimer galore today, is if some of you aren't on electinib or brigatinib, there may be a valid reason. Um, so do not think you're on the wrong drug. Um, I may not be around for all, the whole day, but I know some of my excellent colleagues are coming later to talk to you. Do reach out to us if you feel, well, why aren't I on that drug and what's going on? There probably is a valid reason. So here's, a, and I'm a bit of a fidgeter, so I can't sit and talk, so I'm going to be running around. Um, but, so this is just a bit of a journey of what's happened with ALP to really show you what, why, or where we are at this current point in time. So in fact, the ALP translocation or alteration or, or that ch ALP change was discovered quite a long time ago, back in 2007. And it was 2012 that we first had this drug, crizotinib, which was brilliant in its time. It had some limitations, but it proved itself against, to be better than what was, what was the standard of care chemotherapy. And it became our drug of choice. But it did need to improve. We did need better drugs. We needed better drugs because we know that, unfortunately, the brain is a common site where the cancer can spread to. So one of the biggest developments we needed or changes we needed were drugs that went into the brain better. And that brought us to the second generation drugs. And there are three of those, seritinib, electinib, and then brigatinib. And they all got approved in different paths um, of the treatment algorithm, but now are all available as a first line treatment option. And now we've also got a third generation drug, so drugs evolve, lorlatinib, which at the moment is, is approved for patients, or for, for yourselves, if your electinib or brigatinib fails. But obviously, and I know it's one of the talks coming later on today, uh, there is now data for the activity of lorlatinib in that first line setting as well. So, I'm again mindful I'm actually standing in front of patients, so you may actually have a much better insight into what I'm about to demonstrate now. But in terms of us as oncologists, this is what we think are the pros or, or what needs to be weighed up when we think what is the right treatment for a patient. But as I said, you know, um, Clearly, you're, you're in much better position to tell me what I'm saying is wrong, or you may want to add to this. So one, one, one side of the, the scale is, look, we want the drug that's going to give you the best efficacy. It's going to keep the cancer at bay for the longest and keep you alive for as long as possible. To get that, also, we want the cancer, the drug that gives the cancer the best shrinkage, because if we can shrink that cancer, if you're feeling unwell because the cancer is causing you symptoms, you'll start to feel better. We've already talked about, as, as you're all aware, um, you know, ALK uh, has a high chance of going to the, or higher chance of going to the brain. So we want drugs that penetrate the brain effectively. And we want that duration of response or to keep you on that drug for as long as possible. But we have to weigh that up against side effects. Quality of life is important. And you will vary in terms of what you're willing to take as a side effect to weigh that up against the efficacy of the drug. And hand in hand with side effects goes quality of life. 
Drugs sometimes can be difficult to take. Sometimes you have to take them multiple times in the day. Sometimes you have to take them with food, without food. So this also can add complexity for patients. And there can be a burden for some patients in terms of, again, just the psychology of having to take it. The, some of the drugs can actually carry side effects that can affect things like mood. Um, and again, in certain situations, but I'm glad that's not the case now, there can also be a financial burden uh, for treatment. This is a busy slide, but really just showing what is the current treatment algorithm that we can use as oncologists for patients that have al or identified with an ALF mutation. So if we start on the right. This is quite rare. It does happen, but sometimes when patients are diagnosed with their lung cancer, we may not be able to decipher their ALK status. Now, getting an ALK uh, result is quite quick. There, there's a whole different topic going on in terms of testing, mutation testing in the UK, and there may be some issues in turnaround time, which is a different topic. But there are scenarios, sometimes a biopsy is done and we can't analyze it. There's not enough tissue to give us those results, but the patient's too unwell for a repeat biopsy. So we sometimes have to say, well, okay, we need to crack on with something. So you may, in certain extreme circumstances, I can't think of the last time I've had to, but I can understand if it has happened, is you may have to start chemotherapy as a treatment. But then later on, you may then decide or work out that actually this patient does have an ALK alteration. You can then choose one of two ALK inhibitors, rigatinib or crizotinib. But I'm going to tell you now that in this current day and age, you really shouldn't be going down a crizotinib route. So really, your treatment option should be brigatinib. And that's because brigatinib, we'll show in a minute, I know the talk is about brigatinib or electinib, but brigatinib is, has clearly proven itself to be significantly superior to crizotinib. If you reach a point where the brigatinib fails, then you can move on to lorlatinib. If for some reason you did start with crizotinib and the cancer starts to progress, you can then go to seritinib or brigatinib. But again, for reasons of toxicity and efficacy, in this day and age, seritinib isn't really uh, a drug that patients should be being considered for. Um, so really, it should be crizotinib, brigatinib, and then you're back to lorlatinib if the brigatinib fails. If, I'm going to move to this side, if you are confirmed to be ALK positive, which should be for the majority of you, we've got a choice of all four ALK inhibitors. But for the reasons I've already alluded to, in my opinion, and really should be um, accepted globally, crizotinib and seritinib shouldn't be a first-line treatment choice for you. So it really is about electinib or brigatinib. But you do have this option, and sometimes this does happen, but patients do have certain side effects you can't get over. Uh, and within those first three months, you do have the option to switch to a different ALK inhibitor. And whichever one you go on, so as I said, in this day and age, it should be brigatinib or electinib. You can then move on to lorlatinib if the drug starts to, uh, or loses its efficacy. So we're now going to take a dive into brigatinib or electinib. So again, busy slides, but this is just to show the trial. So we talk, there were two big studies that were done. Alter one, this was looking at brigatinib versus what was the standard of care, crizotinib. And patients, the di well, we'll talk about the difference in trial design, but ba basically you enter the trial, you, get, um, you can have had chemotherapy before, um, but not an ALK inhibitor. And then a computer would decide whether you receive brigatinib or crizotinib. The trial that did, the, the mimic trial for lectinib was called ALEX. One of the big differences was you could not have had chemotherapy before, but again, a computer would then decide whether you receive lectinib or crizotinib. Now, as I said, we shouldn't do trial, trial comparisons, um, but we have, and in, in our oncology world, I've sat at many meetings where we've dissected this data, um, and, and we've looked at the, you know, we've had to look at it, so, but there are some, and this is the reason it's difficult to do trial, trial comparisons, because there are some key differences between the way the two studies were run. As I've already said, in ALTER1, patients were allowed to have had, um, so that's a brigatinib study, patients were allowed to have chemotherapy before entering the trial. And the, in our world, that would, we always feel if you can find an alteration like ALK, patients do better if you do get them on the ALK inhibitor. 
straight away. So you can almost see that patients, some of the patients may have been on a back foot that entered the ALTA study or the brigatinib study. Crossover. So what that means is if you are in the crizotinib arm in either of these trials, what happens when the crizotinib stops working? In the ALTA study, the brigatinib study, patients could automatically switch to receive brigatinib. In the ALEX study, patients couldn't do that. So if you've progressed on crizotinib, you're really left to the realms of what could the, your clinician get for you based on where you were. In, so these were global studies. So it really did depend. Now, a lot of those patients would have got other ALK inhibitors, maybe electinib, maybe brigatinib, but it really did depend on where or what was accessible at that time. Uh, definitely in the UK, it wasn't an easy place to get other drugs. Um, so you've got to think again, those patients may have been disadvantaged from being able to, or, or the, the crizotinib arm may not have done uh, as well. Follow up, that just tells us how mature the data is. That's pretty comparable between the two arms. Alt testing, I wouldn't read too much into that. It always helps if you get central confirmation, which was done in the ALEC study. That means your tissue gets sent to a central lab somewhere in the world where it is, everything is standardized and they know that if you've got an ALK, or, um, ALK the ALK change, it is confirmed centrally. So, you know, there's no discrepancy from, you know, Joe Bloggs' local lab in kind of the backyards of Birmingham versus, so, but, but ALK testing is so standardized that, you know, I'd be highly surprised if there would have been any issues from using local testing as was allowed in the Brigatinib trial. Some other differences, so slightly more patients had brain metastases in the ALEX trial. Um, and the key thing that we've already alluded to is that uh, obviously chemotherapy was allowed in the Brigatinib study. And about a quarter of those patients had had chemotherapy before entering um, the ALTA trial. So really what I'm trying to show here is there are big differences. So I know what, what we tend to do is just go for the money shot. What was the, how long was that? And we'll talk about what the outcome was, which is progression-free survival. But there are some key differences in terms of, um, you know, how trials are run. Now, the one that I've missed out is a primary endpoint. So this, again, is very important. So BIRC means Blinded Independent Review Committee. So in the ALTA study, the brigatinib trial, all the scans that patients would have had to see if the cancer or how the cancer is responding to treatment had to be reviewed in a central committee. In the ALEX study, it was done on what the local hospital felt uh, the response was. And we do know, and we've talked about scanning, and we've talked about responses, but in trials, even when you do them locally, your scans are reported very stringent, stringently. But there is a little bit more lax in local reporting as opposed to what we call the Blinded Independent Review Committee. So the Blinded Independent Review Committee will be a lot stricter and you can sometimes, they will call something that we may not call locally as the cancer getting worse. So again, suggesting that in that brigatinib trial, the rules were a little bit stricter for patients. So what are we all interested in? How good do these drugs work? So what I would stress, what I'm going to do is just go to, so we talked about the primary endpoint for both studies was progression pre survival. So that is how long that cancer or the patient staying on treatment before the cancer gets worse. Now, the brigatinib study, as I said, they reported it by the central review. Alex study did do that, although they didn't call that. So that wouldn't have been that headline data that you would have heard. Uh, it was reported, but it was kind of in the, in the background. But if we look at the Blinded Independent Review Committee for both Brigatinib, we've got progression-free survival. Is there a pointer on this or? No. We've got 24 months and 25 months for Alex. So pretty comparable because for the Alex data, the, the number that everyone remembers is that kind of close to three year mark, that 34 months. But you've got to see that there is a difference in how that 34 months was extrapolated to how the ALTA data extrapolated it. And if we then look at the Brigatinib trial, because they did look at independent review committee as well, we're starting to see actually there isn't a big difference in that primary endpoint between the two trials. So how long you stay on that treatment before the cancer starts to get worse actually isn't that different between the two studies. 
What about how does it control the cancer in the brain? So, again, both studies looked at this, but in very different ways. And if we look at, so that same thing, that progression-free survival, so how long before the cancer starts to get worse in the brain, in the brigatinib study, um, well, it was about 24 months before it did, versus five months for crizotinib. But we kind of knew that crizotinib wouldn't do that well in the brain. So that's really impressive data. That's showing how long we can control um, the cancer in the brain. And these kind of curves, that blue curve going down is showing that uh, how many patients start to get it in the brigatinib arm. And the red curve is showing it in the crizotinib arm. And as you can see, the crizotinib arm drops a lot quicker showing that patients were developing brain metastases or progression in the brain much quicker than those in the brigatinib arm. In the ALEX data, they made us look at this in a different way, so it's difficult to interpret this, but now what we want to see is that the curves have gone the other way. So they looked at something called, called cumulative incidence, i.e. what is the chance of developing that brain met. So we, they flipped it over, but really the red line is the crizotinib arm, and this time the line that's going higher is doing worse. So we can see again that with the ALEX study, actually the brain control is pretty good, regardless of whether the left curve shows those that had brain, um, brain spots at beginning, and the one on the right is those that develop new brain spots. But as we can see in both scenarios, electinib is delaying that onset or that progression of cancer in the brain. So in terms of the key endpoint, or it wasn't the primary endpoint, but obviously what we're really interested in is overall survival. So we've recently had readout of five-year overall survival data for Alex. And what is great, and you're all testament to this, is that at five years, the data is still not mature. And that's phenomenal. We don't see that in lung cancer studies. Overall survival data gets, starts to get reading at, read out at around two, three years. So this is phenomenal. And we can still see that, so the blue line is electinib and the pink line is crizotinib, but you can see both lines are doing well. So that shows us that in that crizotinib arm, a lot of those patients did manage to get some sort of other ALK inhibitor and they're still doing well, but you're clearly better off because you can see the brigatinib arm's doing better. You clearly are better off having started off with the more potent um, drug. And it's really nice also to see that that tail is still carrying on and, and, and we're at five years and we can see a large number of patients still alive, still well, and still that curve is very high. So, you know, and, and this will continue and, and I'm sure you're all aware there are, there are data sets out there, what we call retrospective data sets, showing overall survivals of eight, nine years. You know, it, it's, this is, you guys are testament, like I say, to it, that we're changing the landscape of this cancer into almost a chronic condition. You know, you're staying well for forever, and that's brilliant. All to one, very similar data. Not much to really tease at, still immature. Um, but as you can see, those curves still remain at that same point, close to five years data on here. We're more at the four year mark, but again, um, <clears throat> probably less separation of the curves. That might be driven by the fact that that crossover was allowed. So it was a little bit more generous to let patients go from that crizotinib arm to the brigatinib arm. But again, very reassuring data that patients are getting long-term survival. What about tolerability? I've got experience of both drugs. Um, and Again, what I, what I see with your cells is what I see with my patients. You live full, active lives. Yes, sometimes there are side effects. Sometimes we have to titrate the dose. Sometimes we have to pause treatment for a little period. But on the whole, these drugs are very well tolerated. And I think the key line is probably the bottom line, which is what we call the discontinuation rate. So that's why, or, or for those patients, that the drug had to be stopped because of adverse events. So, and we're around... 13% for both arms, so fairly comparable. So again, what I would say in terms of tolerability, they're pretty similar, but they do carry different side effects. Bulk of them, or a lot of them are very similar, but there are some unique ones to electinib. Um, LFTs means liver function, so we obviously you have your blood test every four weeks. Um, so liver function, I call it more a paper side effect. It's very unusual for you to feel unwell with it but something that we might pick up um, and say, well, look, we might have to pause the treatment or give you a bit of, or reduce the dose. 
Some of you might get, or some patients may get leg swelling, they can get, can get constipation. Sometimes there are some cardiac side effects that can happen with these drugs. Um, something, sometimes the heart rate can drop a little bit, things like that. But these are things, they're manageable. Brigatinib uh, has its own profile, so it has a, a very, well, one of the things that was picked up very early on in the, the Brigatinib trial was a, a lung side effect where patients developed a reaction in the lung, or lungs, can't speak lungs, you've got two lungs should know that, um, in the lungs. Um, and, and, but there was this understanding that that happened very early on. Uh, it was actually quite manageable, and, I, and I'll talk about dosing in a moment, but that's really where this is borne out for some of you that may be on Brigatinib, that you actually have this lead-in of a lower dose before you go to the higher dose, and it's that lead-in period where if you're going to have a lung reaction, it will happen. Um, so, but again, and you get this uh, what was CPK, which is kind of a muscle enzyme that can get released, Again, paper side effect, Very uh, patients that I've seen that in, they've not noticed it. We've picked it up on the bloods and then we've had to, again, modify the dose or do other things. But, you know, as I said, they've got, they've got their own little, un they've got their overlapping side effects, but they've both got their own also unique profiles. Quality of life. We got this for the altered data. Again, it's a fancy graph, but basically tells us that based your quality of life is better and maintained on brigatinib much better than it is on crizotinib. Um, Alex data, Alex trial didn't do quality of life. And yes, that is a huge Achilles heel for that trial. We're very um, focused on quality of life for our patients and, and it's always reassuring. You kind of get a feel that it's going to be better, but it's always nice to see that and to see that read out. Um, so we did get that for the ALTER, tr alter trial. What about convenience? So we've talked about the dosing for brigatinib and electinib. Now there is a difference. So there is a pill, what I call a pill burden. So brigatinib, it's a one tablet. Yes, you have to do this lead in. You have this one week where you have a lower dose and then you go up to the higher dose. Um, and it's one tablet a day that you can take with or without food. As I said, there is a slightly bigger pill burden with electinib. It's twice a day. Uh, it's four tablets twice a day if you're on full dose, but obviously a lower pill burden if you're on a lower dose. Um, and you have to take that with food. For some people, that's not an issue. For some people, pill burden can be a, a consideration. Um, but again, what's really useful for both drugs is that we've got dose flexibility. And dose flexibility is crucial for us to be able to manage side effects. Um, and some of you may be on lower doses, and what, again, is really being borne out is that there's real reassurance that if we do lower the dose, we're not impacting on efficacy. And we're seeing that in a lot of trials confirming that. So don't panic if your oncologist says, well, look, we might have to drop the dose a bit. And you can always go back up. If, you, if things are settling, you can always think about going back up. But both, uh, both drugs give us that element of dose flexibility. So what is the conclusion from all this? We've got multiple first-line treatment options, but I would say that in this day and age for any new outpatient, it really is about electinib or brigatinib. Personally, and I've got patients on both drugs, I do not lose sleep out of the two. They're both great drugs. They both do what they need to do. And I think we're privileged because we're in a position now that we can tailor the choice to the patient. We can you know, we can start to factor in other things such as pill burden, such as specific side effects that I think actually this might be more troublesome for you as a patient. I might go with this drug. So this, they, they both do have their pros and cons, but I would say that you're not on a bad drug if you're on either of those two. And as I said, we can now personalize our choices for you. The real question, and I'm glad I'm not doing that talk, I think you've got Tom and Ali coming later on today to do that, and they're going to have that debate, is what do we do? So lorlatinib is going through its nice appraisal at this point in time as a first-line treatment choice. Um, I was involved in the Crown trial, so that was looking at lorlatinib as that, so I do have a bit of experience of it in the first-line setting. I think this is a different debate, and this is something that, yeah, um, I'm sure you'll enjoy that. I saw Ali at a meeting on Tuesday, so I know he's, I think he sent his slides. I think Tom's held on to his, hasn't he? So, um, but that, that for me is, is a real question. But at this point in time, I think we're privileged. 
to have the choice of drugs that we can personalize for yourselves. Happy to take any questions. So they're not trials looking at dose. So, but what, what tends to happen is for a lot of targeted drugs where we look at dropping the dose is that we look at retrospective data. Well, if somebody did drop the dose, did it impact on efficacy? So these aren't prospective studies looking. There was some work done with seritinib in that sense because seritinib um, did have some issues with toxicities and they, the, the company had to go back and start looking at different doses. But really seritinib has now kind of you know, there may still be patients who are on it now, and I don't know if any of you are, and, that, and that's, you know, it's not, it wasn't a bad drug, but in terms of it had certain issues. So there were trials in that setting, but we're, we're getting very au fait with targeted drugs and, and dose reductions not impacting on efficacy. It's really about, uh, and what I tell my patients is, look, there's no point, yes, there is always a worry about reducing the dose, but we've got to give you, it's better that we can find a dose that you can stay on long term rather than putting you on something and then having to stop for prolonged periods of time because of side effects. Um, and to keep, and, and, and that even biologically means you've got more drug in your body and your system. So it's what your body can cope with and, and take. So, so the, is it just that the fact it's been approved, <coughs> on the side, so that it's been approved for two Yes, nobody's going to be on a dose. So, you, so somebody might be on a lower dose because of side effects, but yes, the, the 600 twice a day is the standard dose. That's how it was done in the trial, and that's what. And, it, and, and the other thing I always say is, look, the trials, they were real patients. So that's where we got these dose reductions from. So in the trials, patients, you, trials are very strict protocols. So if somebody starts getting, we, we grade your side effects. We have this clever book called... It's not that clever, it just says if you've been to the toilet this many times, we'll give it a one, this many times, we'll give it a two. Um, and then you literally follow, well, you can't, I mean, obviously, well, outside of the trial, we use a lot more of our clinic, clinical discretion. We don't have to follow that. But in the trials, they were real patients. So they had, and I don't know if some of you may have been in some of these trials. So, you know, if somebody hits a side effect of X level, you have to dose reduce. So in these trials, these patients weren't sitting there on full dose. A lot of these, and, and that slide showed it, quite a large proportion in both, both arms actually had a dose reduction. So how, how do you then, in your mind, sort of say, okay, you know, to go down to a 75% dose, that, that's likely to be a good side effect. But if you're also putting it on the other side of the scale, does that might affect how quickly the effects comes back? Is no, part of your treatment process or not? no, for me, it, and, and what you do in terms of that dose level really depends on the severity of the side effect. You know, it might actually be that I'll say, look, we need to pause for a week or two here. And then, we'll, you know, uh, pausing is more uncomfortable for me. We know that you take the pressure off, that things can start to start to grow. So if I do ever in that position, you know, for my patients, it's literally weekly review. But in terms of dose reduction, no, you know, it's, like I say, that's part and parcel. And, and yeah, if, some, if it's something that I think actually, actually that's settled, we could look at going back up, I will try it. But if I think, actually, no, that's, you're better off on this dose, we'll stay on it. Deb, Deb, if they put their hands up and get a mic to them. Um, just an observation, um, based on the fact that electinib was developed, as I understand it, in Japan, um, and that Japanese patients routinely are on half the dose, so not 600 twice a day, but 300 twice a day. Um, just an observation that perhaps there could be some interesting comparisons there for studies in terms of um, potential dose reductions here in the UK. Yeah, um, so there is a study called the J-ALEX, so that was actually done purely in um, Asian countries. And it, the data is very reassuring. Um, there was a lot of debate about J-ALEX, about, it's not just about dose reductions, is it one, do, do 
people of different ethnicities have different ways of metabolizing drugs. Yeah. But also we know there's a cultural a difference as well in terms of how clinicians, there's a belief that, and I don't know how true this is, I, you know, this is things that I've heard around kind of meetings that clinicians there have lower thresholds to reduce, um, to do dose reductions. And patients, again, patient culturally uh, will tolerate less in terms of side effects, so will almost want a lower dose from that perspective. There were some other issues, I think, with people on the grisotinib arm jumping ship quicker because they could access electinib because there was that issue of crossover. So there are some other finer details to it. I mean, you can take reassurance from that, but as I said, there were patients in Alex, which was the global study, in Alter, and even in the Crown study, which you'll hear about later, I'm sure, when they talk about lorlatinib, a lot of patients had dose reductions. And even in, in the Crown study, I think the number is close to 60% had a dose reduction. Yet the data is, you know, it's mind-blowing. It's as good as, what well, you know, you know, it's the efficacy levels. You'll see curves that are similar to what I've shown you here. So that's reassuring you that, you know, with dose reductions, it's the, the efficacy is still there. Okay. I'm sorry, related to that question, um, um, I know importance of the taking a drug is, of course, to maintain the cancer, of course. But at the same time, um, even though my side effects are tolerable, I'm always worried that, you know, because the, this TKI drug is very strong, and those strong chemicals, I don't know, chemicals, whatever the drugs is going to be accumulated inside the body for over five years, seven years, whatever long, you know. I, I don't know if any um, study or something, because every medicine has something, not daily side effects, but something over term side effects can be found because at the same time, I'm always worried about taking a strong drug so a long time. Yeah, um, we don't, there's no data telling us that there are any long-term sequelae from these drugs. Um, you know, there, there are other drugs, kind of old school chemotherapy drugs and radiotherapy where we know that 10, 15 years later, if they've had X amount of dose, there is a risk of kind of heart, you know, cardiac problems and things like that. There's no data to suggest that the alexinib or brigatinib one of the questions, so we, we had our, it's called ESMO, which is our European big oncology meeting, and I was at a, and that's why, you know, a lorlatinib meeting um, that I went to in that. And one of the things that I was discussing, because one of the big side effects for lorlatinib is actually raising your cholesterol. And my biggest question then was, well, have you got data about, because, you know, in, in the Crown trials, and, you know, patients like, like yourselves are going to live many years with drugs like, like being on lorlatinib. And, you know, that's wor a worry for me is, well, if somebody's exposed to a cholesterol level, yes, we've got drugs that we can bring it down, but most patients still will have a fairly higher than normal cholesterol level. Is there a long-term sequelae from that? They're quite reassured and they've said that they've got good data to say that there aren't any, they haven't seen any sequelae from that. So things that could happen, heart problems or stroke problems, and they've not seen that. And they said that is data they're going to release at some point. Um, but I, I think those are things that, you know, may need more work. I don't think we can be as relaxed and say, well, your cholesterol's up, it doesn't matter. You know, do we start involving cardiologists and things like that to make sure things are okay? But as far as we know, there aren't any, there's no data to say that being on electinib for five years, six years, seven years is causing you any other kind of long-term problems. Thanks. Um, on um, uh, another question about dose reduction, it seems a little haphazard. So all of my consultations, virtually all of my consultations have been not face-to-face. -face. Um, they've been uh, by video consultation, apart from maybe the first three, because I was diagnosed in March 2020, so pandemic, etc. cetera. Um, and when I was going in, the, and I had nurse-led consultations, which were great. She would go through a whole list of things for me. She'd ask me every single question. She'd check me, like, do you have a rash? What do you mean? Let's have a look at your legs. Oh, you have, there you go. Um, and all these boxes got ticked. Now, since I've not had nurse-led consultations, because they're not done virtually, and I see my oncologist on a screen, he doesn't do that, so he doesn't ask me the questions. So when I get the report back, it doesn't say that I have got muscle pains, that I've got diarrhea, that I've got constipation, etc. It doesn't say it. So he's not monitoring me on 
whatever scale you said it was done on, um, that isn't happening. But something came up recently where I said that I had diarrhea and he said, oh, um, how often is that happening? And I said, well, when it happens, it will happen nine, 10, 12 times a day, which may last for about a week. And he said, right, okay, um, and are you tolerating that? And I said, well, is it a question of me tolerating it or is it a question of the fact that I take my lectinib and then it comes straight back out the other end? He said, well, we don't know. So that seems haphazard. Is there not a way of seeing whether or not you've got a good blood level of your drug if you have a side effect, particularly diarrhea, um, or not? So there's a couple of points, I know Julia's still here, so I, I will say this, you, you are always better off having a toxicity check with the nurse than the doctor. They are much more thorough, much better. But I, I'm saying that kind of lightheartedly in terms of, and it's difficult because you were diagnosed in the past, I mean, I do a lot of tele, or we do a lot of telephone reviews with our patients, but we do like to see them every now and then. But the ones where I'm more comfortable with going to the telephone are the ones that I've already established a relationship with, I know them. I know that they, you know, you develop that rapport with them. You know they're going to report X, Y, and Z. Um, and th there might be other patients that you know, well, actually, they're more guarded about what they are going to tell me, so I do need to bring them in. So, you you know, somebody diagnosed in the pandemic, that's difficult. And I think if you've not developed that rapport with your consultant, you should say, look, can I, you know, we need to get to know each other. Um, and then I'm happy to go to telephone or, or video because if you've not got that rapport, it's hard to gauge like I say, you are all different in how you report stuff. And we know that some of you will hide stuff because you're worried about dose reductions and other of you will keep a diary and, and read that off, you know, and tell us exactly what's been going on. Um, you're not, it, with the diarrhea, it's not that the tablet's going in and it's coming straight out. Um, it means your bowel's getting in, it means in fact you are absorbing it because then the side effect of it is it's irritating your bowel and your bowel's getting inflamed. Um, the real issue is, well, actually at that level, um, either you should be, you know, there are different things you can do. You don't have to reach out for that dose reduction. Well, the first thing I would say, well, I think he, he did ask the right question, whether how or she did ask the right question, but I would probe more. Like, are you maintaining enough fluid intake? Are you eating? You know, let's look at your bloods, your kidney function, that's holding all right. Your albumin levels are good. That means nutritionally you're doing all right. Well, let's see. Let's start you on some anti-diarrhea tablets. Let's see if that works first. Obviously, if you were unwell with it, you weren't eating, drinking, you were dehydrated, then that's, yeah, okay, we need to drop the dose or even pause it for a week. Let's bring you in. Let's see what's going on. It's difficult because, yes, there are, there are strict, they're, they're not strict, there are guidances, there are protocols. There's this thing called the SPC, which you can Google, look up Electinib SPC, it will tell you the drug, it will tell you if you get this side effect, you should think about this dose reduction, this, this, and this. Every drug has an SPC um, there, and it's, like I say, you can just Google it. But it, I don't, I'm a big believer that these are guidelines, but I'm the oncologist, so I need to do it my way. So I won't always go with this. If I think actually I can do this or that, and you know, we, we, we should be able to think that way. Um, so there are multiple, it's hard to know, see individually your case, but yes, you know, and if, if it is the doctor, Again, I know a lot of my patients, and I will just say, look, how are things going? And I know they'll report stuff. I won't be, and I know my CNS, she'll, she will reel off a, a much more detailed review. But I kind of, like I say, I know my patients. I know how to tease out, is something right or wrong? Um, and a lot of yourselves will be, you know, it'll be just a courtesy call. Yeah, everything's fine. I'm, but when trouble does hit, we do need to know about it. So... Yeah, you've got to, I think the key thing is, um, you've got to develop a rapport and a relationship with that on call it, with your team. Um, and it's still fine to then do it remotely. You don't need to come in. And sometimes a lot of those visits, it's, you know, waiting two hours to be seen, pay you for parking, um, just to come in and say, yeah, everything's fine. But, but if you feel you need to be seen, you know, you, the door's open. My door's always open for my patients. Hi, um, I was just um, thinking about progression um, with a monolectinib, but uh, is, is there much known about what causes progression to happen earlier in some people than Sorry, others? I can't see what... Oh, I'm here. Oh, you're there. <laughs> I don't know why I was looking back there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just wondering how, how much is known about, if, if anything, about what, what, what causes some people to progress earlier than others? Um, and is there anything that you can 
you know, I suppose as a patient, you're always thinking, well, is there anything I could be doing that might yeah. keep this drug working for longer? So there's, there's nothing you can do. You're doing the right thing as long as you're taking your tablets uh, and reporting side effects. And, you know, we're doing our bit. There is stuff that we know. Um, if we start looking at a much granular level, so we're not then just looking at the ALK to say, yes, this person is ALK, what will translocate it or not. We can, if we start taking deeper dives into the actual ALK mutations that are going on, we do know that there are certain ones which actually would, may not respond as well or for as long to a drug. That's not a clean science. Um, the other aspect is, for reasons we don't know, there is work out there that we can actually, there are fancy tests that can actually measure uh, what we call ctDNA, so that's in your blood, we can actually measure the DNA that the cancer is shedding. There is data out there for ALK, for other mutations, it's probably EGFR, which is a, a, another uh, driver mutation, it's probably where the most data is, but there is data for ALK as well, where we know that if a patient starts treatment, not everybody will, but if you are positive for that level in your blood, for those patients that clear it after six to eight weeks, you're likely to get a much better disease control with your electinib. Uh, for those that don't clear it, potentially you may not get as long. So that's, you know, there are these other factors. We don't understand why. It's, obviously there is that element of understanding a bit more about what the specific ALK alteration is. And we know there are ones that are slightly more resistant or to electinib or brigatinib and where lorlatinib actually may be a, a better one. And, you know, the, the world which we know is probably not reality, is actually you could choose your ALK inhibitor based on the particular mutation you find. But even in that setting, the patients who won't clear their ctDNA but still may actually do just as well as, so it's not a clean science. Um, but we're not, in the, we're not in the landscape at the moment where you, we, did a, or I, we did a project with our EGFR patients, but we had a, a much easier tool to measure it on them. Um, it is great because, you know, for me, the biggest change was it changed how I monitored a patient, whereas if I knew somebody had cleared their blood level, I was pretty relaxed about their scanning, whereas those that hadn't, I started being a bit more aggressive, and there were other tests we can look for, kind of resistance mutation, and started looking for that more aggressively. So it, it's a great tool, but then also the, the flip side is, and only you can answer this, do you want to be told actually your level is still there? You know, is, is that going to, you know, your, quality, your life is then going to be spent thinking, well, I'm in that, am I in that bad boat? Am I need, you know, is the cancer going to wake up quicker than someone else? Especially if it doesn't change how, you know, what your follow-up is. So there are two aspects to that tool. Um, and, you know, in terms of as long as it's not changing the choice of drug for you, then potentially it may not be information that you would want to know, but I'm, you know, prepared to be corrected on that. Going back to the previous question, is there no therapeutic drug monitoring for levels for electinib and brigatinib? I mean, it seems to me that, you know, for lots of drugs, we measure what the blood level is, and then you sort of can adjust the dose to get the optimum response. For electinib, it's like, well, you just try the full dose, and if you can't tolerate it, you drop it. Is there a reason for that? I mean, is it just expensive to do? Or no, no, so, so for every drug that gets approved, all that is done. But they're done in the early phase trials. So what we call the phase one, phase two studies, that's when we do what we call the pharmacokinetics, pharmodynamics. So again, I don't know if any of you have ever been involved in any phase one trials, but it's very invasive. So you'll take your tablet, you'll then have to literally have a blood test every X day, sometimes even in, in the evening. And that's how the monitoring is done. So, that's what, so those early phase trials are actually done specifically to get to that point of of knowing what is the optimal dose um, and it's kind of a titration up to there and it's kind of a balance between that getting the optimal level versus then too much toxicity so all that work is done not not in i mean the logistics of doing that would it change it does, the, the beauty of that is that guides how we dose reduce in the later phase trials um, and like I say, the impact then on yourselves to start monitoring, one, we would end up having to send all your bloods back to some central lab um, that measures the level. Uh, but to start monitoring every patient for their electinib levels in their blood, 
you, you'd spend half your time in hospital having blood tests. And like I say, the reassurance is, is you get all that done, and that's why the early phase trials are very intensive for patients. And that work's then done, and then that translates into the phase three trials. And that's where we get this paradigm of, and the phase three trials then do the dose reduction, but we, we have that reassurance. We have to then you know, have the reassurance of that phase three trials giving, what those trials are then giving us that information that we can then take out to the public. Otherwise, you'd all be in a, in a living a constant clinical trial. Yes, I'm on um, lalatinib, um, I know it's obviously quite a, a new drug, um, but do you know, is there any data of how long it would work? Because I was on lalatinib and I got four years out of that, so I did really well. But does that necessarily mean I'll get the same, or will I, could it be a lot shorter? Or is this because it's a worry when it's the last kind of treatment? <laughs> it doesn't have to be your last treatment. There are, you know, and, and this is what I always say to my patients that reach lorlatinib, but do not think of chemotherapy as the enemy, okay? Chemotherapy is a great drug, um, and I, in the days of 2012, in fact, my, you know, pre chrysotinib or when chrysotinib was first approved, we had to give patients chemotherapy. And I had patients who had years on just chemotherapy alone. It, you know... To talk openly, the data using lorlatinib after electinib, yes, it's not, it isn't as prolonged a disease control period as if you used lorlatinib up front, but patients vary. Um, and also our understanding of what can happen when patients progress on lorlatinib is growing. So the other concept that is now growing is, is thinking about repeat biopsies or liquid biopsies to understand we, there are certain alterations that may still be targetable um, that, that can happen. So, my, yeah, the world's evolving, but it, don't think of it as your last option. And I stress that to all patients. Yes, we have, we, we become in this mindset of chemo's the enemy. It's not. Um, it's an important treatment option for patients. Yes, y yes, you can, yes. It can cause side effects. Sometimes patients can get very unwell, but at the, it, it's, again, it's like any treatment. You know, patients get difficult times with the drugs you're on. Um, again, it's about modifying the dose. If I always say the only people that have got time to write about the horror stories are the ones who are not well, because the ones who are well haven't got time to write about the horror stories. <laughs> Look, no, I can't sit here and say chemo is a walk in the park, but I've got plenty of patients on chemo who are working, living full lives as well. Um, so don't, don't be anti-chemo. <laughs> yes, we want to delay it. Yes, we want to go on the targeted route to start with, but it still is an important treatment option for you. You talk about dose modification, but all the time you've talked about dose modification, it's been dose reduction. Now, I know there are certain constraints on, on increasing dosages, but for a person who is fully fit, no symptoms, um, tolerating well, has got a four-year record of good blood, good blood levels, um, and there's a slight increase in, in a spot, that is not sufficient to be able to deem as progression, why wouldn't it be allowed to have a slight increase in dosage to see if that actually stabilizes the situation to allow the person to, be, to continue on that drug for longer? So it, it's difficult to look at individual cases. And I did mention before, I'm not averse to dose increases. That's not something that, you know, it's something that I, I do toy with if I think it's appropriate. You know, individual con cases are difficult. You know, if there is a single lesion that's growing, well, I would actually say, well, why don't you think about targeting it? Think about some fancy form of radiotherapy, surgery, burning it. There are other things you can do. Um, the premise would be that if you've got cells that are growing in that one area, but everything else is contained, biologically, that's telling me it's not growing because the dose isn't enough. It's growing because you've probably got some clones in there that are actually resistant to electin. Um, 
Now, yeah, sure, I think if I was in a position where I had a patient and I dose reduced them or we paused the treatment and then their next scan showed massive growth, well, is there an argument that we've taken too much of the pressure off? I think that might be different. And I might say, well, look, maybe let's just increase the dose if, we think you can, if, I, if I think you can take it. You know, that, that side effect wasn't so drastic that we had, you know, that it'd be dangerous to increase the dose and then, and then repeat the scan closely. But, you know, there are so many aspects to what you're yeah. describing that biologically to me that's saying actually those increasing the dose is probably not going to help because, you know, it's not as though you've got globally your cancer's controlled. It just says that one area that's increasing, then to me you've got resistant clones in that. And what I would suggest is, you know, again, it depends where it is and I can't answer for your case, but... I'd be looking at saying, well, what can we do to actually just target that area and then keep you on the electinib? And again, if it's very, very slow growth, I think that's the right thing. You don't need to do anything different just now. Um, I've got a slightly lighter question, and that's al <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> al alcohol and brigatinib. I, always I thought you were going to offer me something. <laughs> I, I, I could do with something now, thank you. <laughs> It's past nine o'clock, isn't it? I yeah, always yeah, feel a bit saying. guilty, on a, you know, on a night out, on a big night out or whatever. A big, so I'm not really sure, you know, everything will... Well, I don't, what do you think? Do we need to be... Do we, I'll take you to the bar. We'll talk about it over a drink. Um, no, it, it's fine. I think, you know, what's key, we know electinib can affect liver function. As long as your liver function's fine. And as long as, and again, uh, I've got patients... You know, it's a big, big question that's always asked. Um, I don't know, it might be the patients that I look after, but, uh, or maybe they just know me well. It's, um, yeah, just see how you tolerate it. If you feel worse, some people don't like drinking once they're on these tablets or they become cheaper dates. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's not a no. Hello. Um, I just want to ask you, I had COVID in July and I was advised to go off the medication while I had the infection. Uh, but also, I wasn't allowed back into the cancer unit until I was three weeks free. So that meant I was off my medication for a full month. Is that something that you would advise? I, I mean, the, the care I've got in Northern Ireland is absolutely second to none. It's been fabulous. But in this particular case, I just was interested in your comments on, would that be an adv advice you would have given? Again, it's very, I mean, I've had outpatients that, uh, and I don't know if any are here, but that um, did get COVID as well. And um, it was very, it was, it was, what I'd say, there was no one rule fits all. It was, you know, is this an incidental test? Is the patient symptomatic? Are we seeing any changes on that? Some patients, it was one of those where we'd done their scan and we could see actually COVID changes and then they, they swapped positive. Um, so there are patients that I paused for about a week or so. I didn't pause it for more than that. We did have similar rules, but we made sure then, you know, that virtually the patient was all right. Virtually meaning as in virtual uh, consultation wise. Um, and and then we 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 ship we we became you know we we adapted quite well at least where I work in terms of shipping tablets out where appropriate, and things like that. So, I, it's difficult. Like I say, I've got to put disclaimers. In the, it's difficult to comment on individual cases because I don't know the the context of it, and there may have been a, a valid reason why I, they did. Yeah, I was advised. Someone switched it off. No, I I was advised that um, they couldn't prescribe give me my prescription without face-to-face -face, and I understand that okay. uh, and that was why this further delay of three weeks before I could get my next appointment to get my new prescription unfortunately my prescription ran out just as I took COVID okay. so that's the reason why I was off for that length yeah of I don't know I mean every trust had to adapt differently every clinician adapted differently I we adapted differently, but yeah, I, I would have probably flexed and said, well, leave the box or bag outside the unit and you go pick it up type thing, or we could wave at you from the window or figured something out. Um, but I don't know. Sorry. Um, I remember um, in the days before lorlatinib, 
um, became well known of. Um, there was a com an online conference I was watching. I think it was from from the U.S. And um, there was a chart in which um, there was a comparison between uh, the number of mutations that ALK will address with the number of mutations that brigatinib would address. And um, the, the conclu basically the conclusion of, of, of uh, the consultant who was talking about this was that brigatinib was the natural sort of follow-on from electinib. I, I mean, I, I hope I'm recalling it correctly. Um, and I just noticed from the chart that you showed earlier, funding options, that here in the UK, the standard, if one progresses from electinib, is then to move directly on to lorlatinib, um, hence bypassing brigatinib. And I just wondered, well, A, whether or not my recollection is correct, and, and B, if it is, um, why brigatinib um, is being addressed. And I realize there may be sort of nice related uh, issues in there, in there as well. So I know, I'm, I'm probably sure you, I know which table you're talking about. It's one that I think everybody that does an ALK lecture puts on. It's, and it shows the, the different ALK inhibitors um, and it shows their level of concentration that was required to then um, inhibit different mutations. There's not, I mean, chrysotinib clearly didn't have much, you know, didn't have much coverage compared to electinib, brigatinib, and then lorlatinib almost has a kind of clean sweep of all of them. There's very marginal difference between electinib and brigatinib. And more importantly, there's very little data of treating patients with electinib than brigatinib. There are some, and I had some, brigatinib was, uh, before it was reimbursed, was available in a, one of those kind of backroom schemes that we try and play with when we can. Um, and I did have a, but to, in all honesty, from what I can remember, any patient that I treated with brigatinib post electinib saw very little traction clinically. So the difference is very marginal uh, in terms of the mutation coverage. So clinically, it's probably not relevant. And so to have that in your pathway wouldn't biologically for me or be a valid treatment option. And that's why my conclusion, like I said, I would put them next to each other as an option. Are there any... No, and, th and that's why I said that what we will have to do is a trial trial comparison because the, these head to heads, there's no incentive for those companies to do it. Um, these trials would take years to read out um, and there would probably be very marginal difference. So, no, we're never going to, uh, I should never say never, but. Oh. So, yeah, so we, we can. Um, and there probably will be some audit type data, but that data is much messier to interpret than um, things like doing a, you know, with the caveats of trial to trial comparisons, because we, as we can see in the room, we all do things very differently. So it's a very uncontrolled environment and you'll have a whole mix of different uh, types of patients, different ways of treating them, different ways of reducing the dose. Um, so it'd be very difficult to actually get anything meaningful from something like that. My question is that um, I, over the last six months, have been taken off electinib uh, several times um, for progression um, in two parts of my body, and then they've given me radiotherapy. Then I've got an infection the last uh, two weeks ago uh, whilst in hospital um, of hepatitis. So then I was obviously, my liver en enzymes were very high. So over a period of the last six months, I've been off of the electinib probably four months out of the six months. Now I've gone back on, they've put me on half a dose. Um, do you think the radiotherapy 
does help with, or do I need to change tablets? That's what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> um, again, difficult to comment on, on individual cases and not knowing what was irradiated and what the scan shown, but definitely my approach um, is to get as long as I can out of each line of treatment. And that means treating through progression. If it's not clinically worrying, i.e. small growth, especially if you are not feeling it, or if there is just solitary areas that are growing, then to think about ways of targeting it, because you're then almost eradicating the clone that's growing, and you've got still, so we know that this is an evolution. So the cancer won't, you know, it's not that all the cells will suddenly start becoming unresponsive to a lectin. They will slowly develop, a clone will start developing resistance, and then that will start spreading. So that if you can eradicate that, um, with a local therapy, it means you keep the, the you on a lectin, and it saves your next line of treatment for a later date. Oh, okay, yeah, because um, the I, I was struggling with breathing, and the actual radiation had ten days of it, and it did. I mean, I'm completely back to normal. So to just stick to the lectin, then really. I would. I mean, it, like I say, it's difficult to comment. <laughs> you know, individually, but as I said, as long as your clinician feels that the, with the local radiotherapy and the drug treatment, your cancer's being controlled with electinib, then I would advise, yes, stay on it for as long as you can. And then if a point comes where clinically you do need to change, then that makes sense at that point. Okay, thank you. Right.